Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Kim D'Angelo, had numerous near-death experiences. But there's one experience, miracle, that happened that is absolutely phenomenal. And that is, she was able to experience the crucifixion, both from the perspective of people that were affected by the crucifixion and as Jesus felt and how he experienced the crucifixion. It's going to be amazing. And Kim, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you, Randy. It's good to be here. Um, do you want me to start with that experience? Well, let's, yeah, let's start. I know at age four, you had your first near-death experience. So yes. share that if you will. I was born with um, some medical challenges that they weren't aware of. And it, my mother said, even as a baby, I didn't wake her to eat. And I was very quiet um, by the, I was still a baby and I didn't have good digestion and I didn't have good motility. And so they had my mother uh, give me things to go to the bathroom. And by the time I was four, I had an experience where I just started to swell and my sister ran for my mother. So she called the pediatrician and he had her bring me, my parents bring me to his office. He did a um, sigmoidoscopy test at it's, I guess you could say a very minor miniature type of colonoscopy. Um, it's a sigmoidoscopy looking for a birth defect. And in the process, he accidentally ruptured my colon. So then they rushed me to um, the hospital. And during surgery, I started crossing over. And I knew exactly where I was going. I just wanted to go. It was so familiar. And I just was happy to be going there. But I wasn't allowed to, to stay. And I was um, basically sent back. And I was very... I, re I the only thing that I, I remember very strongly um, was the the peace and the warmth and knowing where I was going and the love. And then once realizing I was back, I, I remember being not being happy that I was back. Um, but still a, a huge change, even at four years old, there was a, a change in me. Yeah, and we think of, um, you know, the memories of our childhood, uh, how far back we have our first memory, for example, and uh, four years old. But he, I think here's the conundrum in, in terms of uh, having the experience in heaven or, or in the afterlife is that the memory is so much more striking uh, that it is almost as though you're there in the moment. It's more mm -hmm. vivid. It's it has greater staying power uh, than any other type of memory. So uh, that that's a phenomena that uh, is common, uh, Kim. And I don't mean to interrupt your story because we've got a lot to get through here, <laughs> eating up to the crucifixion. So tell us about what uh, what happened uh, next. So you were changed even as a child at four years old, but your um, physical sufferings were were tremendous as you as you grew older yes um so they didn't figure out what the problem was they just it, it this so this was in the um um so i was 1970 i was born in 1966 so this was 1970 and they really didn't know what they were looking for their main concern was to heal the rupture and save my life. And 
I was ended up being in the hospital for several months. I had to relearn to walk, uh, relearn to eat. Um, but I do have to say I, I was treated so wonderfully because I was the only child in a hospital that didn't take children. So I was, <laughs> I was mm -hmm. treated very well. Um, some, somehow, I didn't realize this until a little bit later, till I got a little older. There was something in me that felt that I was rejected by God because I was sent back. And eventually when I was older, I was speaking to someone who actually counseled people who or it, it, people who grew up and as children had a near-death experience, or he also worked with children that had a near-death experience. And he said, it's very common for children at that age, when they come back, to interpret it as a rejection. So yet the change in me, I could feel so much compassion. I could feel other people's pain very deeply. And I had a lot of love in me and um, I, di I didn't have fear. I was very trusting. Um, I also had a great love for Jesus. And I remember at um, four years old also, it was the first time my parents played the song, The Little Drummer Boy on a Christmas album. And I remember hearing the line, I have no gifts to bring. And I fell to my knees and I bowed my head and I said, yes. And so it, it's like that informed my life. And um, I still had cha medical challenges. I would have periods where I was stronger and there weren't any things that flared up. Um, I went to a small Catholic school in Philadelphia and in sixth grade, my parents decided to move us to a suburb outside of Philadelphia. And so I went to another Catholic school, another small Catholic, new one, and I didn't know anyone. And I started um, being confronted by the nun. So there were, there was a, a teacher, a, she was a teacher outside of the convent who taught. And then the other teacher for the grade was a nun. And for some reason she decided that because of my red curly hair, that her words were that I was a temptress and a seductress and problem for the boys. So she chased me through the halls with scissors to cut my hair. And then she felt that wasn't good enough. So she would put me in the closet and lock me in the closet during the school day. Mm. And I remember one day it, at first I was really upset and I never told my parents because there was always something in me that even when my sister did something, I didn't tell on her. Like I just wouldn't share things. And finally one day when she opened the door and she said, what do you have to say for yourself? And, and I knew that I just, I knew this was not right. So I finally told my parents and she, the nun was trying to get me expelled from the school. So my mother decided the next year, seventh grade, she was going to transfer me to the public school. So she, she did. And I went to this new public school with, it, it was so big. It was, it was such a culture shock because I was used to a small Catholic school in a uniform and, and I was doing a book report in the library and I came out of the library and I was walking down the hall and out this one door, I would always leave by this one exit because we lived down the street from the school. And as I was coming out, my, my friends, boyfriends and friends who were part of the football team, they said hello to me. And the next thing I knew, they grabbed my wrists and my ankles and they dragged me into the boys' bathroom. It was 10 of them. And they just started attacking me. And I fought and I, I fought and fought. And eventually, once I could get away, um, I ran into the hall and I just, I ran out with, I didn't have much with me. I didn't even have much on. And I ran down the street to, mm. to go home. And 
I sat on the front step for the rest of the day waiting for my parents to come home from work. And I told them my father really wanted to do something. He wanted me to press charges. And I immediately said to my father, I, I said, I don't understand what has happened to them that they have no love in them. What happened? What are they not getting that they would do this? And then I shut it down. I just shut it down. I would never talk about it again. I didn't let my parents do anything. And I blocked, it wasn't fully blocked, but I think I, I blocked a lot of it. And how old were you at the time, Kim? I was 14 going on 15. Oh my. Oh my. And um, so then I, um, I was a straight A honor roll student and I, my grades fell. And then I was attacked again at 17 and just really, I nosedived, I, I couldn't cope. And because of what the nun had said and her chasing me and, put, and saying all those things about me and locking me in the closet, I believed that this was my fault and that because of what she said, it must be true. And so I brought this on myself. That was what I believed. Mm. And then um, I was, so when I was 17, I just, I started drinking and, and getting high and my poor parents, they felt they didn't know what to do to help me because they felt really bad. They knew why I was doing it. And so there was a concert in Atlantic city. Um, it was a beach boys concert and two of my friends wanted to go to the concert. And so they brought me to the concert. There was over a million people. And that night I don't know how to swim. And I decided I was going to swim in the ocean. And so I started drowning. And somebody in that entire crowd who knew someone I was friends with who would eventually become my husband, he saw me drowning. He didn't know it was me, but he said to his friend, there's somebody drowning. And he, he swam out and he saved me. And I made it back to um, where we were staying. And then the next day we were getting ready to leave and a woman came up to me. She didn't even go near my friends. She just walked right up to me and to look at her, she looked, she looked, you could tell that she was much younger than she looked and she looked very ragged. And she, I just, something in me said she's an addict and she started asking me for money. And then as soon as she started asking me for money, I looked into her eyes and everything in me said, no, she's an angel giving you a message that you have to stop. And as soon as I got that message inside, she turned around and walked away. And what then was that? My, what um, was that message, Kim? Do you remember that? As soon as I said to myself inside, she's not an addict, she's an angel giving me a message that I have to stop. It's like I understood if I don't stop, I could end up down the wrong road. She was telling you to stop uh, the addiction or the drug yes. use. Yes, to stop. She was showing me if I didn't stop what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I, everything in me said she was an angel. And so then I, um, my friends were standing there and they just looked at me and said, what's the matter with you? And I said, from this moment on, I don't touch any alcohol or, or anything. I don't do anything anymore. And we got in the car and I didn't speak the whole ride home. And then once we got to my house and I got out, my friend asked me again, what was wrong? And I just said the same exact thing. And I went inside and that was in the summer and I spent the next um, month and a half just being very quiet and very, I, I was with my parents a lot. I took nature walks. Um, I started writing. And then a friend of mine, she was a very good friend and I had promised her I would go to her birthday party. And my mother got a strong feeling that she didn't want me to go. And 
I kept saying, well, I promised her I have to keep my promise. So I went to the party and there were five of us that went in one car and I was the only one. I, it was so far away from my house. It was somewhere I had never been. And I was the only one who didn't drink and I didn't have a license. So everybody got really drunk and I didn't know what to do. And I didn't want to burden my father. So I thought, well, I'll just wait, just wait until they, until it wears off. So we left, um, we left and as we got in the car, I got such a feeling over me that I just became very, um, it, it wasn't like I was afraid. I just became very still and aware. So we start to drive and then eventually I see an accident happen. It's like a split second. I saw an accident happen and I knew it was going to be us. And I went to grab the wheel, but it was, I didn't have enough time. And we hit a, uh, an embankment, a tree on an embankment. And we went up and tumbled the driver. So as the accident happened, I was above, I couldn't feel anything. And I was looking down and watching the accident. And then it's like I was placed back in the car and the whole front of the car was coming in except for a little box around me. And I had glass from my neck down um, throughout my body and the, the mirror in the middle went through my head here. But as all of that happened, I didn't feel it. And then the driver was thrown from the car. Two of the people in the back were thrown. I'm sorry, one of the per people in the back was thrown and the other two were unconscious. So I had to climb out of the car and I walked until I could find a house. And they called an ambulance and they wrapped me in a blanket. And then we all went to the hospital and um, that's when I ended up going into shock and realized what had happened. And then I spent over a month, um, I was, I had, my mother had to bathe me um, for two weeks every night with a sponge that had these little, they were like little, um, looked like needles and they were plastic and she had to scrape and loosen the glass. And uh, my sister had to stay in my room with me because I kept reliving the accident and trying to grab my head and I was tearing at the stitches. So. I was really traumatized from it. And then again, I had to um, get gradually get stronger and walking. And I had to go back to my senior year of high school with a brace. I had a hole in my leg. I had um, my head was shaved and everyone was afraid. And I, I thought they were afraid of me, but they were afraid because it's like I, I was a... Um, a picture of what could happen, you know, with drinking and driving. And um, my father said that the accident happened at 4.30 in the morning. I'm sorry, four in the morning. And my parents were asleep. And my father woke up screaming my name. And my mother said, what's the matter? And he said, there's been an accident. Kim, Kim needs our help. And so then he went and waited by the phone. So was after he, that was he a believer kim yes yes mm -hmm. and jesus as his lord mm -hmm. yes and so then i um went to school and it was very difficult because i after all of these experiences i just it 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 led to me feeling different and feeling very um alienated and but I also felt like I was growing up really fast. And I started seeking out what I was going to do after school. And I started to work. And then I was working and I was going to college at night. And I, there was something in me that was trying to understand all of this and wanted to know what does this have to do with God and what does this have to do with my four-year-old experience? Like that was starting to come to my mind a lot more. And yet I 
found myself making myself very busy. And so then I, um, I eventually got married and we had a house and land and I opened up a natural food store in an area where um, it was fairly uh, a rural area and things were going well. Uh, the customers were starting to become like, it was like a community. We were building a community. And then uh, something very strange started happening. All of a sudden, I, I'm trying to run a small little store and I had, it was like a gathering there. A woman would come who, um, she said she was from New York and she practiced, um, hypnotherapy and crystals and many of those things. And I didn't really know anything about it. And I didn't, I just wanted to run my store. And then another, um, ma a man came and he said he was from the Aryan nation and he would try to talk to me about that. There was a man who uh, would come every day and he called himself Sam, the Bible man. And then there was another woman who I just remember being very tall with um, dark hair and she practiced Wiccan. So there were, and another woman came from the library and told me that I needed to join the Edgar Casey group. And I just, Oh my goodness. I got it very seems upset. Like, seems like the, uh, that the Paris principalities, demons were, they were, they were after you. It, it, it was so unsettling. And I remember saying one day, I said, I'm really, uh, you know, if, because sometimes they would be there at the same time like three of them and they wow. would be disputing and, and trying to get me on their side. And I just said, I really, I'm just trying to run a store <laughs> and I would go home and tell my husband how unsettling this was. So then um, one night my husband and I were sound asleep and I just remember sitting up and I, there was a, so the street that my store was on, there was a, a large field behind the stores. And I never really knew what it was for because it never seemed like it was used. It didn't seem like anybody was ever there. So I, I kind of ignored it. And, but this one night I was awoken and I saw um, there was women and child and animal satanic worship sacrifice ceremonies going on and it was so horrific and my husband woke up and he saw me and he was shaking me and he was asking me what I was seeing and I couldn't even talk and then I couldn't go to sleep so when morning came I got myself showered and dressed and I went to my store and as I parked my car and went to go to the door right in the parking lot in front of the door were bones put in a very strange shape. And then in blood, it said, we don't want you here. Immediately after that, there was damage to my store. My husband and I found out we had carbon monoxide poisoning in the house. I had two cats and a dog and one after the other, they died. And then I became, all of my medical challenges just flared up so much that, um, I became very, very weak and very sick. And I ended up having severe pancreatitis. I was dropping down to 60 pounds, 50 pounds. I was in and out of the hospital. And um, they were praying, they had prayed curses over you. I mean, yes. they were actually involved in, in, in their chants and what have you, their, pract their demonic practices. They were cursing you. Yes. And so I, I don't know if God had me see what they were doing to warn me. I'm not, I'm really not sure why I woke up and, or if they knew somehow that I witnessed this and that's why they put that curse. It just, it was very strong in blood. We don't want you here. And that just led to an avalanche of, I mean, one, like I said, one by one, my, my animals died. Um, the carbon monoxide poisoning, my marriage started to suffer. And I just truly was in and out of the hospital. And I wasn't able to hold any food down. So um, they started feeding me, they call it hyperalimentation or the TPN. 
and one of them almost put me into a coma. So they um, sent me back to the hospital and they tried to redo the, uh, the feeding and they wanted to put it into the subclavian like they would. Mm -hmm. So this time they went to place the feeding and I just remember hearing something that sounded like an explosion inside and looking up and next thing I knew the room was filled with doctors and nurses. And then I was not in my body anymore. I was above again, looking down at everything. I saw what they were doing to me. I didn't feel anything. I saw my father and a close friend of the family outside and they were, um, I could hear what they were saying. And that I, I heard code blue, code blue. And then, um, and then somewhere in that time, I ended up back in my body and I could feel all the pain. And I was in the hospital for about four months of, um, a couple multiple tries to get the right chest tube to reinflate my lung. So then I made it through that. <laughs> and, um, what I heard my father saying outside the hospital, because the friend of the family said, you know, she's, she's not going to make it the, these, these things that keep happening. And she'd look at her, she's so weak. And my father said, um, you don't know God and you don't know her spirit. And hmm. I ended up making it. And then, but that wasn't the end. <laughs> um, my husband and I, our marriage was just really, really suffering because of all of this. And I went home again. I was sick again. And I just in and out of the hospital. So I, I decided to leave and get a small apartment. By that point, I think I weighed about 52 pounds, somewhere around oh there. My. And 52 pounds. Wow. And I didn't know I, one um, could, uh, I didn't know what an, an adult could could survive at 52 pounds. It, it, I, it's all God. It's all God. Yes. Wow. And um, then once I had the apartment again, I, it, you know, the struggle, I just pancreatitis, pancreatitis. Um, I should back up. There's a piece I, I left out. That's um, kind of important. I, at some point they felt because they couldn't find a proper diagnosis that this was um, me doing this. And so they, um, they, they had my parents and me convinced I needed to go to a, a facility for eating disorders. Well, once there, they were feeding me three times a day, three trays per meal and Sustacal. And I ended up losing weight. And then I started to become jaundice. And so a, res a doctor from the connecting hospital took my blood work and he called my mother and he said, we have to get her out of there. And the psychiatrist running the facility was trying to have me court committed. Mm -hmm. So he decided I was doing something to lose the weight. So he made me sit in a wheelchair and I wasn't allowed to move. And this lasted for like three months. And um, I remember the doctor coming to me and he got down on his knees and he said, we're getting you out of here. And he said, I'm sorry. And I, I just one treat, she, uh, one tear down my cheek. And I, I think I was just so, um, uh, there was a combination of numb and surrendered and kind of confused. I don't understand all of this. And then I um, was transferred to the medical hospital and they um, had the top psychiatrist from Philadelphia evaluate me because that other psychiatrist was determined to have me court committed. So the psychiatrist from Philadelphia sat with me for over an hour and he, when he went to leave, he just took my hand and he said, you're a woman whose voice is not being heard. And he wanted me to write you up, but wait till he sees what I write. And then they brought in a new doctor and he was a top research doctor for cystic fibrosis. And he started putting the pieces together medically. And then 
I went back uh, home to my apartment and all through this, my mother was, she was with me so much through this. I mean, she would leave work. She was coming to every hospital. Sometimes she slept at the hospital with me and helping me with my apartment. So at some point, um, now my husband and I were still married, even I, but we were separated. So then I had um, at some point felt that, and, and the doctor who thought this was cystic fibrosis wasn't sure. So there was, there was still some like vagueness and I got to a point where I sunk into, I felt that all of that spiritual warfare that was going on was my fault. Um, all the things that happened, you know, the rapes when I was younger, my fault, like it just, my marriage falling apart, my fault. And my parents now suffering, my fault. So they, they had sent me home with, um, a, a prescription, a bottle of um, Demerol, and I never took pain medicine orally, but it was a uh, hundred tablets, 50 milligrams each. So I went home on a Sunday morning. I'm so, it's yeah, Sunday morning. And my mother was helping me in my apartment and she left around like 2.33 ish. And I just decided I was determined that I was gonna end everyone's suffering. So I wrote my parents a very long letter, thanking them, telling them, this is hard. <laughs> mm. Take your time, Kim, I know, uh, to the point of desperation of considering taking your life, uh, you know, evokes the severest of emotions. And you were at that point of wanting to give up. I mean, you had experienced uh, a glimpse of heaven at an early yes. age. So you knew the peace and yes. comfort that came from, from being with God. And this world certainly had tormented you throughout your life to this point. So, um, you know, you were at that point of desperation. Obviously you're with us today. So, uh, did you, did you physically try to take your life? I I did. I wrote my parents the letter. And then I had a CD um, that had some songs that I loved. And there was only one real spiritual song on it, which was Amazing Grace. So I put the CD player, uh, the CD in the CD player. I laid the letter out for my parents. And I took all of the pills. I just took them all at once. And I drank them, drank something to bring them down. And then I laid down. And I just put my hands across my chest and I just kept saying to God, I kept saying, Father, I'm sorry. I love you. I'm not quitting. I just want everyone's suffering to end. This is, there's too much suffering with me. And mom and dad need peace. They can't figure out what is going on with me. So that's what I was saying to myself. And then eventually my body would convulse and I, remember so profoundly spiraling. It's like I was literally spiraling down into this dark, cold abyss. It was so dark and so cold. And a hand, a forearm and a hand kept reaching and lifting me up. And this voice that I recognized said, no, you're not done. And that went on for the whole night. And then at some point, I guess I started to slip and then I felt someone slapping my face and I opened my eyes and it was about, so I took the, the medicine at four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. My home health care nurse came 11 o'clock on Monday and she was slapping my face and I finally opened my eyes and I see her and my father and my father's crying and she's yelling at me. Kimberly Ann, what did you do? And, and then in the background, I hear Amazing Grace. And the song Amazing Grace got stuck. The CD got stuck on that song and it just played over and over. Wow. And I mean, to me, that's not a coincidence. No. Um, 
And then um, they rushed me to the hospital and they ran many tests. And my father said that while he was in the room with me, he was just praying and he was, he was so nervous. And he said, all of a sudden there was a warmth around him and a peace. And he said, he saw an angel on one side of him, kind of down at my feet. And then on his other side near my shoulder. So he saw two angels and they told him it's going to be okay. And then I ended up leaving that day. And the, the doctor told my father that because I only weighed 48 pounds, my health conditions, I had an enlarged heart, um, that I should have, first of all, I should have died, he said. And being that I didn't, I should have had brain damage or been in a coma. And I was completely fine. And I remembered everything. And so then I am back at my apartment. And I get very sick again. And I'm in the hospital. And this time I'm in the ICU. And they're saying to my parents that I had about three days left. So something happened in me that I, I was so surrendered and I had a peace and I said, I said, God, it, I'm whatever you want. And I said to my mother, I would really like to die in love and warmth. Can I die at home? I don't want to die in the hospital because I had just spent so much time in the hospital. And then I asked my doctor and my mother and my doctor talked about it and my mother very, very courageously said yes. And then I went home to my mother's and well, while I was in the ICU and they said I had three days left, my husband gave me divorce papers. So oh. I knew that, you know, but I didn't have any, um, I didn't have any animosity uh, eventually I did feel hurt from it, but I didn't have an animosity because somewhere deep in me, I knew a lot of this had to do with that, with what happened in front of my store and what I saw, but I didn't know how to articulate it or fully understand. So I didn't have animosity toward him. And I just, I actually was filled with compassion and just such surrender to God. And so my mother brought me, my mother and father brought me home. And I, my parents said they took turns praying by my side. And I slept for days without realizing how much time would go by. And then I would wake up for a little bit longer and a little bit longer, got a little stronger. And then, um, Eventually, I was just leading a very simple life, and I truly was living, I have no idea when my last breath is. So I was very much living in the moment and mm. just really seeking God and, and resting and praying. And um, I started to hear that, that voice, and I describe that voice as it's like gentle yet thunderous rushing water mm, I and know that voice yes <laughs> <laughs> and you can't um not not know once it speaks you know exactly who it is yes and so i um but what i as i was getting stronger um one night as i was going to sleep i said i just said out loud to god I've been through so much. You've, you've brought me through so much. Somehow I'm still here. And I said, I just want truth. I want truth. And I said, I don't want any teaching between you and me. I don't want any creature between you and me. I don't want any voice, not even my own. I said, I don't, at this time, I was really, um, I mean, I was very sincere. And I said, I don't even want the Bible. And I don't want how Jesus has been taught between you and me. I want absolute truth. And I went to sleep 
And the next um, morning, as soon as I woke up, that voice said to me, um, the only wrong turn you can take is to deny my love, my will, my grace. When you are full of doubt or worthlessness, that is not my voice. That is not how I speak to my children. And that, I, I so I, I wrote it down as soon as he said it to me. And I just, I reflected on it again and again. And then I felt him leading me to the Bible. And I went more deeply into the Bible. And things, it's like the Bible was coming to life in a way that I, I can't express. I would read things and feel like, like I'd been there or that's the only way I can say it just felt so real. And then um, I started feeling a much stronger presence and I started, it's like my heart was just calling out to Jesus. And I remember when I read um, where Jesus says, I have not come to live of my own whim, but to live the will of the one who sent me. It literally felt like somebody pierced my heart. And I started reflecting on my life and just, it was something in me was saying, I'm his, I'm his. And then I still was having medical challenges and they were um, treating me more, you know, with the cystic fibrosis. And then because of all of the challenges that my body went through, I had autoimmune conditions surface. Mm -hmm. So at one point they had me on a uh, chemotherapy medication once a week and it could cause cold sores. And I was also um, getting a possible cancer diagnosis. So I had a cold sore that I had for a few weeks and it wouldn't heal. And I woke up one morning and I remember being in the kitchen and I, I said, here we are again. And I just started screaming out and I said, I don't know why you're keeping me here. All of this suffering, it's just suffering. Mm -hmm. And I screamed, I got on my knees and screamed, Jesus, this lip won't heal. And I had been blotting, trying to stop it. And he came and stood in front of me and he just showered me. And I pulled the napkin away and his crucified form was on the napkin and my lip healed. His and, crucified form was on the napkin. Oh, my. And um, I couldn't talk for, a, I showed the napkin to my mother, and she just hugged me and held me. And I couldn't talk for a couple days at all. And um, so he was drawing me. It's like, all the, you know, he just kept drawing me and drawing me in closer yet he wasn't giving me an understanding of all the suffering and, but the love was just drawing me. And um, so then I became more and more devoted. And then one night I was washing my face and you know how when you wash your face and you kind of like you lift up and you're just washing it. And all of a sudden I became a black silhouette it's like I was gone, but light, this golden electrical light was all around me. And I dried my face and I, I remember just going into my bedroom and sitting on my bed and just holding my arms and saying, is that you? That's your light. That's you. That's you. And what I kept hearing was, you are the light of the world. And I was saying, we are the light of the world. Like that was deepening in me. And I wrote... Um, I do not have life because I have breath. I have life because of his light. And then I started to go, I'm sorry, do you want to say something? No, no. I was just thinking about he's the light of life. Yes. So then um, I, I, as these things were happening, I was, um, it's like he was withdrawing me from the world for a bit. And I became 
my life just became very much about him and prayer and uh, living a very simple life and still not knowing how long am I going to live? Because the other thing that they discovered accidentally, which is what they should have found when I was four, is that I was born with a collapsed artery pressing on my duodenum and small intestines that causes lack of blood flow and it's inoperable. So everything they said, the cystic fibrosis, the artery, you're not going to make it past your 40s, the, at the most your 40s. And so I was in my 30s at this point, and um, I was approaching 40. Um, then in 2008, I was uh, taking my prayer walk, and there's a part of the walk was um, there's a church, and then across from the church is a very small cemetery, and in the center is one of the most beautiful sculptures of the crucifixion and so every day i would go before it and i would just just be quiet and still and i would sit and place my face on the feet and i would just pray and that would be my my place to go and pray and then i would walk back home and this one particular day i start walking toward toward the sculpture and the next thing I know, I'm actually seeing the entire crucifixion. The sky changed, everything changed. And I was witnessing it. And there were, I was in, in the midst of a crowd. And I fell prostrate on the ground. And I started dragging my body and reaching out my right arm and just sobbing and saying, I can't get to you. I dragged my, it, it was like I was dragging myself. And then I got to the feet where I would sit. And this time in let, in, instead of sitting, he lifted me up into himself. And he had me experience what he experienced. And he had me look out at the crowd, at, out at us, humanity, um, from his eyes. I experienced it was like looking out and seeing all the pain and seeing that miss, you know, um, all of the misguidance, all of the lies that people believe in and are told and um, misunderstanding and just the pain and suffering crucifying him and the love coming from him. It, it was filling me, the love, it, it's, I can't express or explain that love and the agony and the joy all at the same time. And eventually, I used to not be able to share this without crying. <laughs> eventually he placed me back at his feet and I had no more questions. I just didn't need any more answers, any philosophy washed away, any, um, I was so filled with this silence and stillness and all that kept running through me was he loves us before we ever do anything. His love is so inexplicable and so different from human understanding. We don't understand how we can be so loved before ever doing anything. So we don't true. know how to love each other that way. And it, it truly was like my heart was cracked open. And I don't even know how I made it home. I have no idea how I walked home. And then I went into days of prayer. And he just started showing me so many things. And um, then he gave me an experience where it didn't matter where I went or who I encountered. If, if it was somebody um, sad, somebody that seemed to me like they were being mean, somebody that uh, was poor, homeless, anything, he placed his face on everyone. So everywhere I looked, I saw the, it's like every person he put his face on. And 
I remember it leading me so deeply into understanding of whatever you do for the least of these, you do unto me. And the empathy that just the openness, it was, it was like I had no more boundaries and it was um, very overwhelming yet at the same time, that joy, that love and joy, even though he was placing the suffering, it's like humanity's suffering was placed in me. Mm. And even though that at times could feel debilitating, the love and the joy were also inexplicable and they were there and they were, it's like he was carrying me. And um, throughout a lot of this, I just kept giving myself more and more to him. And um, there was, I should have said this before, before this happened, there was a point where um, I was really just wanting God. And I had said that prayer to him that I wanted truth. So I was in my room and there's a line to a song that I used that I loved and it was um, I will speak no more if it be your will I will speak no more and stand upon that hill until I am spoken for and I heard that and I laid down in bed and God drew me so far into himself that he sustained me for over a month just on him and he brought me through an experience of there was nothing but God. It was, I describe it as pre-creation. So it was just God. It was, there was nothing. And then, and it was utter peace and stillness. And then it was like there was water. I was, uh, just felt all this water. Then there was light and then creation. And I saw his hand in everything. And I came from that experience so blissful. He washed love over me and it was like I was new. And I came out of that um, thinking, I've encountered the ultimate. I've now experienced ultimate love and the ultimate experience with God. Like that, I came away thinking that. And it was after that, that he started putting a wounding love in me and cracking my heart open. And Jesus started coming more to me. And then he brought me through the crucifixion experience. And it was after the crucifixion experience that I realized, no, this is the ultimate love. And I just, I shared it very scarcely at first because when I did share the reactions People had a hard time hearing this. So, but I would always say that once he placed me down at his feet again, I knew that everything comes from him, through him, and is to return to him. And it just, he, he was, he was my all, is my all. <laughs> and um, so it's, and there's, there's a lot more that happened and there's more, but I feel like they're the most important things to share. Um, and if it's all right, Randy, I wrote down some of the things that he said to me. Please, please share. Yes. Um, he's said other things, but I. By the way, while you're looking that up, Kim, I uh, just an observation here. It may be a Holy Spirit impartation. I'll, I'll give God the credit if it uh, resonates with our audience. And that is what early on when you said or asked God to, to reveal only the truth. And of course, Jesus explained himself as the way, the truth and the life. I also follow that no one comes to the Father but through me. But he is the truth. So John eight thirty two says, uh, "You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free." Yes. So you were set free for this revelation of the truth. But I believe also the Holy Spirit gave you that 
uh, revelation or that desire to know his truth because he is the truth. And yeah. when his truth is revealed in the personhood, not just the full knowledge, but the personhood of Jesus, yeah. yes. that frees us because you, and people may be asking, I'm going to give you that um, time to share what God told you here in a moment, but some may be asking, okay, why so many miracles? Why these special seeing the, the crucifixion and feeling, having the empathy with Jesus and, and feeling, sensing, having the empathy with the, the people and, and why so many of these miracles? And I believe it is because of our sister Kim had gone through so much suffering the Genesis 50, 20, what the enemy intends for harm. Actually, it's spoken as what, it's spoken as, as uh, what, what others had intended for harm. God will turn for good. Yes. So he knew, even though, and that's one of the biggest questions is why does God allow suffering? But even through the suffering, it was not imparted by God, by the way. It was imparted by these others, other powers, principalities, not even the sorcerers and the Wiccans and all of that. It was the spirit in them and upon yes. them that was yes. doing these, these attacks. It wasn't God, but God knew all along through this that he would turn that for good so that this temporary suffering for a moment in, in the span of eternity would be turned to release. And we're going to see releases, by the way, Kim, I know it, of people who have been in bondages that they don't even know about, they're going to be freed. So back to you on uh, what God uh, spoke to you about, please. Uh, um, <clears throat> just before that, if it's okay, Randy, I I wanted to share this. I probably should have shared it in the beginning. But when I was very little, um, I had these two recurring visions. And one was I was in a circle. There was a circle of us. And we were just wearing these very plain tunic like things and we were holding hands and we were singing in harmony to God. We were in joy, harmony, love. The other vision was it would be like night and this entity would be chasing me and it would chase me. Uh, I'd get I'd be on a bridge and it would be chasing me and it would grab me by my throat. And just before dying, it's like I would be released and get to the other side. So at some point I became so afraid because these were, you know, it was just reoccurring and I just wanted to sleep in my sister's room and she was my older sister and it annoyed her. So then I started lining my window, every area in my bedroom with all my stuffed animals. I thought they were going to be my, you know, my little mm. <laughs> protectors, but, um, something in me as a child was seeing and seeing um, maybe memory or it's like I was being given this vision of these two things. And then all of these things happening in my life. And even after Jesus took me through the crucifixion experience, um, I was confronted again by that entity and I was walking to meet my mother and it kept trying to say to me, um, it wanted to study this and study that and that I needed all these different things. And I kept saying, for me, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I'll pray for you. And then I would try to walk a little more and it would drive, it was in a car and it would just drive around and come. I knew it wasn't a person. It's like the antenna just went up and I know this can sound crazy to people. I know a lot of people have trouble believing in these things. Um, so then I was in my bedroom and I did start praying for it. And I was lifted off of the floor and thrown across my room. And then that night I was being lifted out of my bed and it was choking me. And it was saying kill over and over. And I didn't have much, <clears throat> much strength, but I just kept saying, Jesus, love, Jesus, love. And I kept saying it. And then my mother came in and she and then it stopped 
and I landed back down and she just grabbed me in a blanket and took me downstairs. And I stayed downstairs for two weeks. I was very afraid to go upstairs. And I finally went back up into my room. And at that point, it, it basically ransacked my room. And I had a candle in the room and it, it lit the candle and burned it into a beastly looking face. And I screamed and my father came in and he looked and he just hugged me. And then I just started crying and I said, why me? I don't understand. And then I went back downstairs. And at the same time, even though that was happening, Jesus was coming so close. And the, the understanding that I got from it, he was giving me a lot of his experience and he was also giving me an under, like from all of these experiences, I couldn't look at anyone and judge anyone on their spiritual growth or their level or um, how they are spiritually. Um, I couldn't look at anyone and say that I'm better, I'm doing better than them or I'm right and they're wrong. He filled me with, it's almost like I was brought into such humility that I, I just became um, more and more devoted to him and abandoning myself to him and finding all of my strength in him. Mm. So um, he's, he's, I'm sharing that because and, and I know I'm not alone in this experience. I've met a couple people that um, I've met a lot of people who think that once you have an experience with Jesus, that your life becomes smooth and you're going to prosper and you're not going to have hardship. And I've learned that that isn't true. That isn't always true. Mm -hmm. And I, he's filled me with loving him for him and loving for the pure sake of love, not loving him for any reward or any gift or to, to make me anything. I just, it's like the love he kept pouring into me. I knew he wanted me to love in that way. And so that's what I've, that's what my, I've, it's like I gave him my life as prayer, and that's what my life has become about. And now I'm devoted to caregiving for both of my parents. They both became um, ill in 2015, and mm -hmm. so I'm their caregiver now. So mm -hmm. um, I feel it's important to share that because I do meet people who, you know, they feel that God they've done something wrong or God doesn't love them or they're not worthy because they're having such a hard experience. And I've just learned that we don't merit anything, that it is all grace. It is. And this is a fallen world and we live within fallen bodies for various reasons, genetically and spiritually in some cases, because this is a fallen world. And this is temporary. The Bible says this life is but a mist. So, um, and the great news is that in heaven, certainly there will be no memory even of, of those sufferings. But it's made, accentuated the impact of your ministry, Kim, because you speak with a voice that cannot be denied. And I, you know, I, uh, just an aside, and we'll get to what God told you here in a moment. Uh, the words that you wrote down, but I've been in, uh, for a period of time, I was in deliverance ministry. It was very, it's very tough uh, to be in that because you're always, you're, you're seeing things, hearing things and being at the effect and the enemy is coming after you in the process, trying to get you down and speaking lies. And we've seen, you know, movies that don't depict accurately what that's like, deliverance. Uh, but, um, it's bizarre, mm -hmm. it, but look at the book of Revelation. That's bizarre. Yes. 
Yes. Look at Jesus walking on water. That was bizarre. Look yes. at him healing all of those people. That was bizarre. Yes. And, and there, we live in the bubble of what we think we understand or can understand. And that tends to lead us to discount these things which are beyond almost our own comprehension. And we say, oh, you know, that's false. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't experience it myself or that's not something I can relate to, therefore it's false. But um, that, that's clearly not the case. If you look at the Bible and what God did, you know, he clearly through the expression of the Bible was performing things in a way that was apart from this world. Yes. And Jesus said, you are not of this world. He is not, was not of this world when he walked on in this, in this world, in this earth, uh, that our world, that is our true world, the kingdom of God is not of this world and we are not of this world. So anyway, just an aside there. So validation, because a lot Thank of what you're you, sharing, I, uh, you know, I have experienced, we talked about the, I had a coughing fit at the beginning of this. I like that you said, you know, we're not completely healed. You know, we're not like, <laughs> okay, miraculously, you know, um, and, and I, and I, and we had technological difficulties when we began. Um, and I you remember I said to you, well, this is going to be a good one because the enemy doesn't want this to happen. And there were all things, there were things cropping up and it was kind of laughable because it's like, you think you're going to get the last word in this? You know? Right, right. <laughs> Romans eight twenty eight. all things work for good to those that belong. Yes. Uh, and a call to uh, Jesus Christ and are, are called according to his purpose. Do you think you're actually going to get the, the win in this? You're fools, you know, the enemy powers, principality, spirits of darkness are fools. Anyway, okay. Now, if you would be kind enough, God spoke to you words and you wrote them down. Would you be willing to share those with us, please? Um, <clears throat> he said at different points, he said different things. These are just some of them. He said, your ticket has been purchased, bought and paid for with no debt incurred. You only need to remember my love is always with you. And in this love is always where you need to be. And with me is always who you are meant to be. And in the sweetness of my peace, you will again be embraced. Coming into your full potential is disappearing into me. He also, um, He had said to me before that, um, do not miss me in your striving. I am not, I do not see you as broken. I am not looking for perfection. My grace is always with you. You don't need to prove yourself to me. Just swallow some, just show me some humility, swallow some pride for me. And I will be the one to drink your grapevine and to wine. I will be the one to ferment proof fine. Um, he also, he uh, placed at different times, he would um, say things to me like I would be maybe fretting or um, trying to figure out what I had to do. And I remember one day I was really, um, kind of torn and he, his voice just told me to stop. And then he told me to close my eyes and I did. And he said, look, he said, close your eyes, look around afar behind, no more and be given to see exists just enough. Somewhere between imagination and creation, you are in the hand of completion. And when he said that to me, it's like everything that he had been showing me all through this journey and the things that he's said, it's, it's like he wanted me to be, the more I was self forgetting when he said coming into your full potential is disappearing into me. 
And all I could think was pick up your cross, deny yourself mm. and follow me. And then that hand that lifted me when I was falling and spiraling into that abyss, when he said to me somewhere in the hand, somewhere between imagination and creation, you are in the hand of completion. And I truly understood that the completion is up to him. He is the one to do it. He's the one that completes. And as long as I stay in that hand, that hand that raised me from dying, that hand that is, we are all of that hand. And then in um, 2019, it was shortly before everything with COVID started. I was walking around the high school track and I was praying and my parents were going through a lot. So I was kind of just saying to God, I need help. This is very hard. And as I looked up, there was a forearm and it's like a forearm and a fist in the sky. There were virtually no other clouds. And I kept thinking, okay, I don't know if that's there. So I said, I'll walk around again. I walked around the track three times and it was still there. So I finally took a photo of it. And then I showed it to um, a couple friends and they both saw it. And then I showed it to someone else and they saw it also. I was kind of checking myself. And so I, it's like throughout this life, he keeps telling me, you just, you know, it's me. I'm here. I'm the one doing if you just sit in my hand and you just surrender into my love what needs to be done is going to be done mm. very profound very profound and i love that uh it, I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase here between imagination and creation is completion that's what you said kim in his hand you are in, in the hand, hand of completion Yes, in his hands. And that's interesting. We can dwell on that for a while and pray on that, but it will be after this show or this program. Um, what that means, imagination. I'll just say this one thing about imagination. Uh, we think of imagination as being fake, you know, just imagining, conjuring up something. But imagination by, in the, I believe the spiritual definition is uh, as, as, as God references it, cause I've heard that term and I've wrote about that is unfettered thinking and imagination yeah. is giving up our conceptualization of what is yes. to God imparting to us what truly is yes. unfettered thinking is allowing his truth to be imparted to us in his yes. fullness, which is not always what we see. And here, so we need to keep the proverbial open mind, you know, to say, okay, uh, you know, through Christ, all things are indeed possible. Philippians four thirteen. Thank you for sharing those those words, Kim. Uh, we're, this is this is going to be powerful for a number of reasons. I believe God is going to speak out the Holy Spirit. That is some words for uh, people who are watching or listening to this as we pray so don't log off because we may be speaking something out for you and you'll miss it and it may affect your life going forward in a positive way as everything that is through christ is positive and for the good so you don't want to miss out on that so uh, Randy, I would just like to say, even with all of the um, experiences and the suffering, I don't, I, I don't look at it as negative. There are times I have, but I, I don't. I, um, he brought me to a place where I don't see positive and negative anymore. I, um, <clears throat> I really have. It's everything is in His hand and in His time and for His reason, and. I know that Jesus didn't come and live an easy life. And so I just know that this life, he just has been drawing me. It's like everything has been about him. Ultimately, it might seem like, oh, this story is about Kim's life, but 
the interweaving of all of it, it's all about him and his presence. And um, I've just come to understand mercy on a very beautiful level. And so I, um, I'm grateful. Mm, that's true freedom. So your joy is not dependent upon the situation or anything that happens in this world. It's strictly dependent upon your relationship with, with Jesus. That's so beautiful. So beautiful, Kim. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Very important. Um, anything else, Kim, before we, before we pray? Thank you very much for letting me share this, Randy. Oh, it's been I, a I, I, My prayer is that it is that people can see the love, the pure love, mm -hmm. and can find in in all of that I've shared can find some maybe hear something that they really are loved before they do anything. Yes. This has been deep. This is not superficial stuff. This is not, uh, you know, treat your neighbor like yourself. Well, that's great. You know, second commandment by Jesus, love God with all your heart of being the first. But this is truly deep. It goes to uh, revelation. It goes to the spiritual revelation that causes transformation in our lives. So now, you're watching or listening to this and we are speaking God's authority now in the name of Yahweh, Yeshua. We're speaking his authority over your life right now. Every power principality, spirit of darkness that has attempted to come against you or is coming against you now is bound by God's authority by the authority of Yahweh. Why can we speak so boldly about it? Is because whatever you, Jesus said, whatever you pray in my name, it will be established. We prayed in his name, it is established. You are indeed free. And if you are suffering from an illness now, if you are suffering from mental illness, physical illness, spiritual or soulful corruption of any kind, right now we declare healing over you and in you in the name of Yahweh, that you are freed in the name of Yahweh. I hear the name Patrick. I hear the name Joanne. I know those are common names, but there may be multiples of those names. I hear the name uh, Isabel. I hear that name. There are multiple names coming to my mind right now that you have been released and freed of what God, that doesn't mean that you're going to maybe walk out of your hospital bed right now. It means that here in the heart of hearts, you are made free and you may indeed be free to have experienced your miracle in the physical, uh, especially in those instances of mental illness. Mental illness, I believe the Lord right now is healing people of mental illness, bipolar disorder, um, and um, of mental illness in schizophrenia, in depression, uh, and there's one other um, in, um, oh, it's gonna come to me here. There's another disease that he's freeing people of right now, freeing a mental illness. In Jesus' name, Kim, other things that you want to pray or you're going to speak forth for our audience right now. My greatest prayer is just that anyone listening will come to know who they truly are <clears throat> in Christ, that his love is the ineffable ultimate love. It is the truth. It is the way and it is the life. He is all of it. And that his arms are open like the world. He doesn't reject us. 
He just has his arms open for us. Uh, like he said to me, walk out on sin into the arms of redemption, a love that never ends. And so every time we turn to him, his arms are open. And I just pray that whatever anyone is going through, if they feel alone, if they feel alienated, if they feel isolated, if there's someone like me who had a lot of suffering and yet they're, you know, they love Christ and they are Christian, yet they're judged because their life doesn't seem to fit. I pray that they hear Christ's love and Christ's heart with them and for them and that they can find peace, just true, true peace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' Amen. name. And we conclude by praying for you. Join me in prayer for our sister Kim D'Angelo right now. Uh, we pray for you, Kim, that from this day forward, even though your ministry and your life has been profound, that God would multiply your effect. I know it's being multiplied now, so this is going out to many, many people across the world. But not only that, but we pray wholeness over your body, um, complete restoration of your health, uh, we pray healing of uh, disease states that you have uh, right now in Jesus' name. Uh, we pray that uh, you would be out, your lungs would be healed in Jesus' name, that you would be given a, a full life, a long life to impart the profound truth and love of God, which is what it's all about. So we pray blessings and protection over you, and we plead the blood of Jesus Christ over you, Kim. Thank you so, so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. You've been a great blessing. And so our sign-off is this. If you are indeed in Christ Jesus, having confessed your sins, knowing that he, as Kim witnessed, he sacrificed himself on that cross because of his love for you. And you confess those sins, laying them at his feet, and then having repented of those sins, receiving his forgiveness, and making him Jesus your Messiah, Lord, over your life, and you are indeed going to be in heaven. Praise God, and God bless you. You too, Randy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe, and if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.